revolutionary Leon Trotsky said that there are weeks where a year's events are condensed into them, such as the pace of developments. And I think we are going through a period exactly like that. What has changed over the last two weeks is almost everything. Every political conversation that you participate in now, in every home, workplace, university, uh, whatever has changed. It's broadened, uh, the possibilities have expanded, and the idea of taking radical action has seemed more possible than it has done for decades. And that, of course, is because of the victory of uh, Jeremy Corbyn uh, in the election. The sights of everybody who's fighting for real improvements to the living standards of ordinary people have been raised. Everybody who's fighting for a £10 an hour minimum wage, to end the cuts to important services, to stop <coughs> the destruction of our safety net, the welfare state, those who are fighting to end foreign wars of intervention for profit and oil. All of those people will have been emboldened by that uh, victory. And uh, the first thing I want this, wanted to point out is something obvious, uh, and it, it shows that change is possible. Uh, and one of the things I think it would be good for us to discuss tonight is what role we, you, can all play in that change. Because the Socialist Party believes that fundamental change is possible, what we call revolutionary change. That there's nothing inevitable about the perpetuation of the current capitalist system that we live under, where the running of society, the control of the vast majority of wealth, resources and power is monopolised by a small group of the super rich, while the rest of us are consigned to a life of frustration, of struggle, of alienation and for many of us uh, poverty as well. We fight for a socialist society, one that's run democratically by and for all ordinary people and I want to appeal to everybody here to join us in that fight, in that campaign to build uh, that society. And we believe that every eruption of struggle, every campaign, every major demonstration and fight back, and today there are many, uh, you can't turn your head without seeing an example, is a more or less unconscious striving towards that fundamental change. You could take any example, you could, you could take the rash of strikes that we're seeing developing nationally and locally in the transport system, probation workers, uh, museum workers, uh, many others. Those groups of workers are fighting for concrete demands, for specific things, for a decent pay rise after years of real terms pay cuts while uh, the rich continue to profit. But they're also challenging something more fundamental, they're contesting fundamental te tenet of the current uh, order, that it is not up to ordinary people to contest how the wealth is distributed in society, despite the fact that it is exclusively ordinary people who create that wealth by going out and doing use useful work. Or you could take another example, the, uh, the fantastic a protest, solidarity demonstrations that we've seen recently uh, in solidarity with the refugees. They're fighting for very immediate aims to satisfy the basic needs of uh, a group of people who have, uh, you know, been through some terrible hardships. But they're also a protest against the current order, against a system that put profits before ordinary people, that sponsors wars for oil, for resources, for prestige, uh, for profits and is willing to destabilise sensitive parts of the globe in order uh, to fulfil those aims. And Corbyn's victory is another example of the, that eruption, that eruption of uh, a rejection of our current uh, system. The dam is breaking at many points and the representatives 
of the elite, Cameron and uh, co, don't have enough fingers to plug all the leaks. We're seeing breakthrough after breakthrough, but what a breakthrough Corbyn's victory was. I mean, look at the figures. It has destroyed the idea that being against austerity makes you unpopular. Or that Miliband lost the last election for Labour because he was too uh, left-wing. 59% of those who participated uh, overall voted for Corbyn. That's three times the second place candidate, the fake left Andy Burnham, and 13 times the hard right arch playwright Liz Kendall. 15,000 people participated in campaigning for him. Uh, that on its own could be uh, a new party. 100,000 people signed up to uh, participate, mostly to vote for Corbyn. That's not including the up to 100,000 people that the Independent reported uh, could be the number of people who were blocked, mostly uh, for spurious reasons by bureaucrats in the Labour Party machinery attempting to stop uh, the surge. Uh, and there's been a new uh, surge of people joining uh, since uh, Corbyn's uh, victory to try and back him up, uh, in particular seeing the, uh, the attacks of the right wing. Uh, Labour's close to its 400,000 recent uh, peak membership. So is the job done? Have we got a vehicle that we could use to defeat austerity? Is this it? Does it mean that the grip that big business had obtained over the Labour Party has been broken? Well, if you believe George Osborne, then you would say yes. Not a reliable source, perhaps, for us, but he said that a generation's work has been unravelled in 12 months. But I think we have to take a sober look, actually, at what the Labour Party uh, is. Margaret Thatcher uh, said, when asked what she thought her greatest achievement was, that it wasn't the privatisation of vast swathes of the economy, it wasn't the defeat of uh, the trade unions uh, engaging in major battles, it was the creation of new labour. And that was a process spanning a couple of decades which saw the uh, the transfer, the, the, the transformation of a party uh, that working class people could use to fight for their interests uh, into a party where the victory of capitalism, which actually always had agents inside the Labour Party, was uh, virtually complete. They did it by expelling the serious organised left wing around the militant tendency, many uh, uh, former members in this room I think, uh, they did it by uh, eliminating the influence of working class organisations like the trade unions. They did it by shutting down the internal democracy. They did it by changing the character of the previously working class membership of the organisation. And they did it by freeing the MPs that are the section that is closest to and most responsive to the pressure that big business exerts on the organisation. They freed them. Uh, and largely gave them uh, total domination over policy making. And the legacy of those changes are still here. So is it impossible therefore uh, to use Labour to defeat austerity? Well, we don't want to dampen anybody's enthusiasm and the, uh, the, uh, you know, the force of, uh, the, of the mass movement trying to find an exit and a, a, and a way to uh, out of the impasse is uh, unpredictable and we wouldn't rule anything out. It's extremely difficult, but it's not impossible that Labour could be transformed. But it would need a bold and determined effort and it would need a plan. The forces of capitalism thought that they had the situation sewn up with the transformation of Labour, but it is capitalism's curse to recreate again and again the forces that are destined to overthrow it. And uh, looking at, at, at the route that's been taken, you would be forgiven for thinking that this was a fluke, that it was down solely to the mistakes of those right-wing MPs who happened to open up the voting system beyond the existing membership of the Labour Party, and then, in order to try and demonstrate that Labour is a broader church than it actually is, allowed uh, Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn to get onto the ballot paper in order to try and um, assuage those who were leaving it. But both of those developments are, are as a result 
of the developing class conflict uh, that is uh, a result of the, the attempt to, inf to uh, uh, implement austerity. Uh, they were forced mistakes, uh, is the reality of it, and it's taken a route through the Labour Party because of uh, the absence of the building of uh, a new vehicle outside it which could have been carried out by, uh, by the trade union uh, leaders or by other means. Corbyn's victory is a step on the road to the creation of that anti-austerity vehicle that we need, but it is only a step, and I think it's important to make that point, uh, because I think there will be lots of people actually who will think that the process is complete. Uh, I think there are, there are certainly many who supported Corbyn who think that the job is done. And uh, there will be uh, you know, certain announcements about policy that will uh, you know, drive people towards questioning that assumption. But it's absolutely essential that it's understood that it's not over and that it has to be driven forward. Because as it is, the Labour Party cannot be used to end austerity. It would have to be transformed. How could that be carried out? Well, Corbyn supporters, those, who are, th those of them who are inside the Labour Party, would have to take up the odious task of getting stuck into the organisation and doing battle with the right wing that are occupying fortified positions, entrenched positions uh, inside uh, that. But they won't win without the strategy. And the Socialist Party has put forward the idea of everybody who is fighting austerity, who is against it, whether they're inside the Labour Party or outside of it, to get together for a conference, uh, Corbyn could call it an anti-austerity conference, to discuss uh, what would be necessary uh, to win. By the way, I mean, if you're looking for a conference to discuss these ideas, Socialism 2015 is coming up. In London, it's a fantastic event uh, at the beginning of November. It's organised by us, and I'd encourage everybody to buy uh, take us in the goal. Um, the right wing in Labour occupies virtually every key position apart from Corbyn's and some of uh, the cabinet seats. Less than 10% of the MPs supported him and less than 6% of the councillors. That's the scale of the task. The right wing is extremely powerful but it's not all bad news. At the moment they're also paralysed. They're paralysed by the scale of Corbyn's support, by his mandate, by the enthusiasm which currently exists for him. But that won't last forever. And already you can see the right wing in the Labour Party plotting. Uh, you see the predictable uh, announcement. Simon Danchuk, excuse me, Danchuk, who's uh, uh, an MP, he's, he's more like a UKIP entryist into the Labour Party than a Tory. Uh, he's that right wing. He said he would be work he said on, on, on the radio in public that he would be working to bring Corbyn down from day one. Chuku Amuna called a meeting of what he called moderates, who are uh, in reality uh, extreme uh, Blairites, to discuss their strategy for, uh, for bringing him down. But they can't move at the moment, but they are preparing. Don Jarvis, who's another right wing, I said at the Labour Party conference yesterday, Labour has got to get better at removing failed leaders. And they will do their best to make sure that he fails. You see the way that uh, these MPs jump on the attacks uh, uh, in the, the right-wing press about, uh, you know, about, well, about everything, but about um, you know, seeing the national anthem and, and everything else. Because the real situation in the Labour Party is that it is two parties. It's a new Labour establishment party that's a safe pair of hands for capitalism with an anti-austerity party emerging uh, within it. And we've ended up with that hybrid because the ever-creative working class has done what it doesn't usually do, actually. It has pursued the path of most resistance to the creation of an anti-austerity party to try and take on the right wing inside uh, Labour. Now, how far that process can go within, side, uh, uh, within the Labour the limits of the Labour Party isn't clear, but for it to go anywhere, the left has got to use this window to take bold action before the right organises a coup to get rid of him, carries out uh, a, an SDP-style split. They split the party in the 80s and left wreckers within the organisation. Don't worry about the flag falling down. It seems to happen in every meeting. 
uh, or, uh, or, or fights to regain control of a policy and effectively neutralizes Corbyn, turns him into Rapunzel. At the top of the tower, but a prisoner. And uh, to do that, that would mean restructuring the party, democratizing it, so that the hot breath of ordinary people could be felt uh, on the back of the necks of these MPs who are plotting. And it would also mean announcing bold policies that will maintain the enthusiasm of those who are gathering around him and convince wider layers that he is different, actually, that there isn't uh, an appearance, he is different to uh, your regular politicians. So what would that mean? It would mean making the conference the highest decision-making body of the organisation, where every uh, branch uh, sends delegates, and what the conference decides isn't an optional uh, you know, a, a bit of advice that uh, representatives can either take or ignore, that that is the policy of the organisation. It would mean restoring full freedom of discussion and debate, including the right to different tendencies to get organised, to discuss how they're going to campaign to convince others of their ideas. It would mean uh, restoring the influence of working class organisations like trade unions. And it would also mean taking action against these entrenched right wing MPs. And that means the mandatory reselection of MPs, giving the power to local, uh, local members to decide whether the, the MP that they've been campaigning for is the one who should stand uh, for the next, uh, next election. Uh, and how could that be achieved in the face of what I've described as the uh, uh, overwhelming domination of the right-wingers in powerful positions? Well, it would need to include uh, the building of a mass movement outside of the structures to continue the pressure that's exerted uh, on those MPs. Uh, and apart from the structural points, you'd have to take similarly bold steps with regard uh, to, to policies. And there have been some good announcements so far that we've heard. He's pledged to undo the anti-trade union laws. We have the most restrictive laws uh, limiting the action of trade unions in Western Europe, and they're uh, about to be made worse. <coughs> Said that uh, trade unions taking strike action will be uh, supported. Uh, they defended the right to protesters to take action. They talked about rent control, about doubling the number of council houses or housing association places built, capping rents to bring down housing costs, abolishing the benefit cap, uh, and many other policy, uh, positive policies. But we've also seen the erosion of some of those positions as well. Take what would be an extremely popular policy, the idea of renationalizing the railways, of taking it into public ownership. Uh, or the idea of renationalizing the energy companies, two, uh, two organizations that are uh, proverbial for ripping off the ordinary people who are uh, their customers. Uh, on railways, the announcement was that uh, first that, uh, that the railways would be nationalized, but only when the franchises came up. Well, that would take too long. It would mean that uh, in the first five years, first term of office, only a third of the railways would be nationalised. Uh, but also, they've stepped back even further from that and said that private companies would also be able to bid for those franchises. So they're stepping back in a way that will be seen as a signal from men, by many that, uh, that, uh, uh, that the proposal isn't serious. And on the energy companies as well, has refused, uh, has actually categorically refused to nationalise the big companies that are hated, actually, because of their uh, uh, the cartel way in which they operate to, uh, to push prices up. Um, and uh, Corbyn has said that he doesn't have a monopoly on wisdom, and that he wants a discussion on policy, on what would be necessary to change the situation. And we welcome that. We would like to participate in it. Because there's another reason, besides maintaining the enthusiasm of the activists, who've got involved with the Corbyn campaign, why well, he's got to be bold, and bolder than he has been actually. Uh, one reason is to do with credibility. It's a big mistake to imagine that being credible means being credible to the institutions of capitalism. Uh, and some of the steps that have been taken, uh, McDonnell, for example, uh, the shadow chancellor, saying that he would submit the policy at the, uh, the the Labour budget 
to the OBR, which is a, a Tory body, Tory Quango setup, uh, which will uh, inevitably limit the radical, uh, how radical the ideas can be. It also said, uh, giving completely the wrong message actually to the wider swathes in the population, that Labour MPs will vote for Osborne's proposal for what he calls fiscal responsibility. It's a huge uh, mistake. It's similar to the mistake, actually, that in Greece, Syriza uh, uh, made. Uh, but if you look at some of the other policies as well, uh, in order to be credible, then they have to make, uh, they have to make sense. They have to be persuasive. And uh, uh, he's talked about the idea of building an investment bank in order to end the investment strike. And this is a massive uh, issue, actually. There's, uh, according to The Economist, £850 billion lying unspent in the bank that comes to big business, while we see hospitals uh, threatened with massive cuts and all of the other important services starved of, uh, of cash. But we won't get our hands on that cash without taking bolder action than has been proposed. It would necessitate not the building of one publicly owned a bank, how would they get the, the resources to invest on the scale that's necessary? It would require the nationalisation of the whole of uh, the banking system and the, and, and the financial system. Uh, and those kind of bold, bold policies would get huge support if they were put forward uh, as well. And, uh, but what's holding back? Well, it's this, this, this idea of conciliation uh, with the right wing. Uh, and there's a, a hugely mistaken idea uh, that what is necessary now is to rebuild unity between those who have joined uh, the Labour Party attempting to build this anti-austerity alternative and those who previously occupied the top positions within it who are only interested in finding a strategy to push the profits back up uh, for capitalism. Conciliation with that right wing will be absolutely fatal. It, it won't appease them, but it'll whet their appetite for more, it'll demonstrate weakness uh, and uh, it will demoralise uh, the left-wing support. So it's, ne it's necessary to be bold. And really, it's a choice between uniting with that right-wing element or uniting with all those people who are hit by austerity, or the, 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 the people who are parents of the one million children who have uh, who were, uh, pushed into poverty under uh, the last uh, government term. It's a choice between uniting and, and maintaining the enthusiasm of those people or backing off in the face of the challenge uh, from the right wing. I haven't got time to make points about electability, but I think that that has dominated in some ways the debate uh, in the press, uh, the, uh, the capitalist press. Uh, but one point I would make about it is that uh, the press has to work extremely hard in order to persuade people that popular policies make you unelectable. Uh, they have to repeat it again and again and again before it uh, even uh, you can even imagine that it's uh, possible. Uh, but it also says something about the system that putting forward popular policies that would improve the situation for ordinary working class people could become a, uh, a disadvantage in, the, in the, the system that we've currently got. And it'll stimulate people towards uh, uh, supporting radical alternatives. I haven't got uh, time uh, to go into, uh, into that. So how far will the process uh, go? Well, we can't predict, but we also can't wait. Because the next round of brutal austerity is on its way. It's going to be channeled through councils onto services that are already uh, cut to the bone. Uh, and uh, we have to find a way of resisting the implementation of those cuts now. Not wait for, uh, uh, to see how this pans out in the Labour Party. That's why the Socialist Party is in favour of a dual strategy. It's, uh, it's part of the destruction uh, of Labour's democracy that in any case we're, uh, we're, we're banned from, from joining the organisation. But we also think it would be a mistake to wager everything on that transformation. It's necessary to build a force on the outside that will challenge austerity politics in every council election, in the Welsh Assembly elections which we're fighting uh, next year as well, and everywhere else where we where, where hear them. Because Corbyn might be the leader of the Labour Party in Westminster, he's not the leader of the Labour Party in all those cities where Labour controls the council, councils and uh, uh, could mount a stand against the cuts, but instead implements 
uh, it implements them and does what the, uh, the Tories demand. So it's still necessary to build uh, an anti-austerity coalition, which we're doing with other socialists, trade unionists and campaigners in the trade unionist and socialist uh, coalition. We want to fight alongside to build that alternative uh, for austerity. Now I know, my, just my final point, is that I know there's a lot of people here today who are probably coming to their first political meeting and probably arrive with a lot of enthusiasm, you know, and, and, uh, and I think it's important to hold on to that. When we discuss in detail the obstacles that are in front of us, not to say that uh, therefore we should give up, but so that we've got our eyes open and we can navigate around and over uh, those obstacles. And we're, we're optimists, we're you know, incredibly uh, optimistic about what can be achieved. Uh, and we should be emboldened by what is the elemental anger of a mass movement that is building to challenge the old status quo. We should be emboldened uh, and see that it's, it's rising and it will find a way forward, whether it's through the Labour Party or outside it. And uh, we can look forward in the future to not just cracking the monopoly on political representation, that big business that the capitalist system has at the moment, but to smashing it completely. And with that act, we can look forward to opening the road to a fundamental transformation, to the creation of a socialist future. And I urge you all to join us uh, in that uh, pursuit.